Hello good people, I am Arkham and welcome to Almost Wise. Yours truly in an unfamiliar settings, let me explain. So you know when I make one of my video essays, they are in fact actually essays that I sit and write and prior to that I sit and read many plenty of books and the thing about finding stuff about stuff is that oftentimes wisdom is hidden in places that you don't necessarily think it would. For instance, I gained more insight about human psychology by reading Dostoevsky than I did by reading Freud. I found out more about human relationships by reading Tolstoy than I could ever do by studying anything else. I learned about cherishing the little things in life by reading Shel Silverstein's poems more than reading any other self-help book. And since learning is an active process and we tend to draw parallels from links between different pieces of information and oftentimes the whoa and aha moments mostly occur when different aspects of information contained within our mind organically come together as a whole and start to make sense. There is no shortcut for that. Therefore, what I try to do is to present those links and insights to you and not merely narrate what different people say about different things. In the process, however, I do get carried away at times and go on what I term hopeless research tangents, where I uncontrollably fall into the spiral of know everything there is to be known, which of course is an idiotic thing to do. However, I do end up collecting a lot of material, and the final essay is a trimmed version of that. Therefore, in these videos, I shall be going through the stuff that did not make it. Additionally, I will also try to answer your questions and revisit some of the concepts that I thought or you thought required further explanation. So this is the video after. Please proceed if you have watched the video before. So in around the mid of the 5th century BCE in Athens, there began a movement of the OG life coaches and gurus known as the Sophists. The English word sophisticated comes from it. These people knew how to speak and orate and boy did they make a career out of it. Revered and feared for their skill and intelligence, these folks sold their services for hefty mounts to wealthy Athenians who basically sucked at public speaking and at other life skills. Not much caring about the morality of it all, these hotshots only cared about winning, be it arguments, speaking contests, debates, or lawsuits. They were hired by people who could afford them and learned from them the art of how not to suck at public speaking, how to win any lawsuit even if you had a crappy case, how to launch kick-ass businesses even if you are not very smart. In short, how to win in any and every situation. Protagoras was one of these sophists and he was utterly despised by Plato and had said the famous line that man is the measure of all things. Giving foundation to the earliest secular relativism, there is nothing out there, we make it all possible and nothing is right or wrong but we make it as such. And this is the context in which Plato wrote the dialogue The Aetetus and the fact that knowledge as perception is debated over in the beginning of the dialogue. While reflecting over some of the concepts in epistemology, I could not help myself but ponder over the subjective elements of sources of knowledge. Whether someone's idea counts as knowledge or mere opinion would be determined by status as a leader or a loser, and not always by anything in the idea itself or its relation to the reality. It is absolutely possible that a mechanic at an automobile workshop could accurately teach me how to check my blood pressure. It is also entirely possible that, that a doctor could teach me how to paint perfect oil portraits. A scientific theory coming out of a university professor could very well be built on a lie and an ice cream seller out in the street could tell me precisely about uncertainty principle. But in reality, this isn't how it works. The only reason we believe a university professor is always telling the truth is because of his established credibility, and it is quite fair to take it into consideration most definitely. It is, however, fallacious to consider this a necessary element of the packaged truth. The truth could be well outside of it. But we fall prey to it all the time. If Leonardo DiCaprio is worried about climate change, then we gotta do something about it. If Malala says that girls are not allowed to attend school in Pakistan, then it must be true that all girls in Pakistan are not allowed to go to schools. Credibility, however, can be engineered synthetically. Once established, it doesn't make it easier for us to identify the truth, but in fact, harder. 
So the fascinating thing about reading is that no matter how much you read, there's always stuff left to read. At all times, you just haven't read enough. I must admit that before I initiated my research into the topic of, of epistemology, I had never heard of Roderick Chisholm. It turns out the guy is, is an uber rock star in epistemology and single-handedly brought back the idea into the larger debate of the problem of criterion, or in other words, the starting point of knowledge. I address this in the essay with the example of identifying pigeons. Now say in the case of a total intellectual pandemonium where emergency has been declared to come up with a definition of knowledge, the modern man would argue that we must apply canons of science, common sense and reason in order to reach the truth. These things certainly help us orient ourselves towards the truth, but they are certainly mere choices that we make, hoping that the future will behave like the past. Where have we heard this before? future acting like the past induction so even if you ignore everything else about the problem of criterion we will still run into the problem of induction if we analyze our sources of knowledge we can't help but acknowledge that a lot of it comes from some form of a testimony we are trusting our friends or media or authors or elders teachers parents and historians and etc and it only makes sense that we must resort to it because knowing everything is just not logistically possible for us, both in terms of geographic constraints as well as time travel related things because we can't travel back in time and we can't see whether somebody actually saw something or whether somebody has told the truth in a history book. Let's take the concept of escape velocity. It's a velocity needed for a body to escape the gravitational pull of Earth, let's say. I know that there is something called escape velocity. I've never personally tried to escape from Earth's gravity, even though sometimes I wish I just could. I got close once when I was in Amsterdam, but that's a different story. I believe in it, however, because my science teacher told me to. He believes in it because it's written in our physics textbook by very credible people. Those people must have done the experiment themselves or must have seen someone do it. Unless we are able to perform the experiment ourselves, we believe in what we are told based on the following. The number of witnesses we can gather and their integrity, their skill or their ability, the internal consistency of what is conveyed or whether or not there exists any contrary testimony. So testimony thus becomes a proper channel to gain knowledge. However, if we are probed to levels which can only be defined as annoying, we would most likely resort to, well, I know it not entirely because I heard it or read it or I'm simply believing someone, but because I think it sounds reasonable. Something sounding reasonable is again a matter of belief and like we discussed in the main essay, all held beliefs are held via very intellectually unsatisfying justifications. In order for anyone to come forward and assert that what they hold is not a mere belief but an actual item of knowledge, it seems to me that they must put something akin to their own credibility at stake, something that gets affected adversely if proven wrong and the claimant should endure some sort of consequences. Falsification seems to make a lot of sense in this case. Imagine when Albert Einstein predicted that a gravitational redshift will be observed and it will prove or disprove his theory of general relativity. If there was no redshift observed, then there will only be one place where his theory will end up in. The garbage bin. So every time we claim knowledge we are putting ourselves at risk and we must put ourselves at risk. And this is the beauty of truth because it's self-correcting, naturally selected. Next, I wanted to expand a little on propositional attitudes. So we're predisposed to believing certain things more conveniently than other things. Some people have a tendency to fall prey to conspiracy theories or, in other words, have propositional attitude of belief towards such possibilities. Others are gullible when it comes to supernatural explanations, rendering them dispositionally superstitious. Take, for example, the belief that black cats crossing your path means bad luck. So being in a situation where a black cat crosses your path 
is at least a three act scenario. Act number one is you're walking without a black cat in sight. Two is you observe a black cat and it's crossing your path. Three is you panicking or not depends after the black cat has crossed your path. Consequences of such an experience may render the following two possibilities. Bad stuff happens to you, such as you fall into a sewer and ninja turtles beat the crap out of you. Or bad stuff does not happen to you. In other words, either bad stuff happens after the catastrophe or it does not. There is no other possibility. Now for someone who has been raised believing that cats are evil and black cats are in fact wicked witches, may brace himself to be subject to bad luck as getting a beating from ninja turtles or something like that. And so it therefore only strengthens their belief. For someone who does not see any correlation between such events, does not pay heed at all even if bad stuff does happen to them after the fact. Your beliefs and ultimately your personal truth is often a consequence of your initial propositional attitude. Uh, now additionally, there were some very important concepts that of course I came across and I studied but I did not include in the final essay for brevity's sake, which now I believe should be mentioned at least in passing. One of which is the concept of necessary versus contingent truths. But before we get into that, we need to understand the difference between a priori and a posteriori. A priori or analytical knowledge is anything that we can know without experiencing it or observing it, which is also called analytical judgment by Kant. A priori means uh, before experience. I can very well sit in my chair and reach a sound conclusion without having to observe or experience anything. These truths are true by definition. The predicate is contained in the concept of the subject. Take, for example, the proposition that all bachelors are unmarried. The word bachelors does not require any further explanation as the definition of the word is a self-contained concept. Rational knowledge is a form of analytical knowledge because we rationalize things without leaving our houses. We're just sitting and not observing anything. A posteriori or synthetic knowledge is anything that we cannot establish the truth of without experiencing or observing. It is also called synthetic judgment by Kant. Take for example the proposition that all bachelors are happy. The term happy is contained within the concept of the word bachelor. Let me think of another example. Take for example the proposition that a hurricane travels at a speed of 200 miles per hour. The specified speed of the hurricane is not part of the definition of hurricane. Therefore, we must need to go outside and measure the speed of the hurricane in order to establish the truth of the proposition. It may or may not be traveling at speed of 200 miles per hour. A posteriori or synthetic judgment extends our knowledge, extending or adding to that which is already known. Empirical knowledge is a form of synthetic knowledge because more than a definition or a predicate within the concept of the subject is required. The definition of hurricane is not enough to know its specific speed. Now, prior to Kant, the realms of analytical and synthetic truths were known to be mutually exclusive. All synthetic knowledge must be a posteriori for it requires experience. All analytical knowledge could only be a priori because it does not require any experience. However, and this is the mind-boggling genius of Kant, he proves synthetic a priori is not only possible, it is in fact how we observe the world. The categories of our minds are the grooves through which we perceive the world. Categories such as quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Everything that we perceive is in fact interpreted through these innate categories of understanding. These categories themselves are a priori. The concepts such as unity, negation, reality, possibility, existence, and so forth do not require experience. So every time we observe and experience anything in the world, we use a priori categories to reach a posteriori conclusions. Moreover, anything that is deemed universal or necessary must be a priori because different observers could interpret experience in different manners and subjective evaluation cannot be called universal. Everything that is non-universal or contingent must be synthetic because it is observation at the end of the day and observation is always empirical. Kant claims that if we are ever able to 
convert or make the transition from metaphysics into actual physics, then this knowledge will have to be synthetic a priori. Kant says, if you're ever able to scientifically grasp concepts such as God, prophethood, intuition, revelation, and so forth, it would only be possible by using the existing categories of our mind, the innate abilities to interpret such knowledge. Kant, however, also claimed that this knowledge is transcendental and cannot be reached by our reason. And this is why I had introduced some of Ibn Arabi's concepts of knowledge as an alternative to Kant's understanding of knowledge and its limits. Finally, I wanted to bring to your attention the two kinds of rationalities. See, we take this word for granted and we would often say it's stuff like, man, think rationally. There's no rationality in your thought or you have to be very rational about it and so on and so forth. But rationality is actually of two kinds. There's something called instrumental rationality. Instrumental rationality has nothing to do with truth. We don't care if we are reaching conclusions based on truth. All we care about is our own objectives. So we would rationalize things which are instrumental for us in achieving our goals. These marketing people tend to target this all the time because you know, every time I'm trying to upgrade my iPhone, I don't need that iPhone. It's not a rational decision. The rational decision would be that I have my perfectly fine iPhone. It works pretty good. I don't need to buy this. But my rationality would somehow come up with ideas that would nudge me towards making that decision. I would still be rational thinking that, oh, it has a better battery, or oh, it has a better screen, which is not going to hurt my eyes in the long run, and so on and so forth. All of these things are actually rational. They only aid me in making the decision which I have already made. The other type of rationality is called epistemic rationality. And this is a rationality which is more interested in truth itself. So, for example, truth, no matter how harsh or bitter, I, as an epistemic rationalist, would always go with the truth, because that is the ultimate purpose. Now, both of these rationalities have their uses, and we use it all the time. Say there's somebody who is stuck in a in an elevator, and the only way out for them is to jump, say, 10 feet below or something like that. They've never been in that situation, so they're like, I can't make that jump. But truth or epistemic rationality at this stage is actually detrimental because the truth does not matter at this time because what are we going to do with the truth if we're not going to survive so we have to tell ourselves we have to believe that we can make the leap we can make this jump and we can actually survive so sometimes for us to move forward instrumental rationality actually does play a part but there's a moral aspect of that should be under all circumstances always go with the truth or there are cases in which we could use or we could be instrumentally rational because that's the right thing to do in the circumstances. And that concludes the video itself. But I'm gonna, I received a couple of questions, so I'm just gonna go and try to answer those questions very quickly. Uh, Anush Shahid asks, I have a few questions, please. How do you do such thorough research about these different topics? Well, I read and I read a lot. One of the reasons why I created the channel was because I wanted to streamline my reading habits. Uh, there's work, there's family, there's plenty of stuff that goes on and it becomes very difficult to read uh, with discipline. So now by focusing my attentions on one essay specifically, I download the material, I get as many books as I can on the topic and then I just read them all and then I read some research papers, I go on forums, Quora, YouTube videos and then that's basically how I do the research. She then asks, how do you decide the topics? I also mentioned that in my uh, Instagram Q&A session that I don't really go and decide on a topic. It's whatever occupies my mind um, the strongest i would just decide to write and do some research and write an essay on that but i have these things that i feel very passionate about and the fact that not much has been done 
on those topics, especially on YouTube. That's how I decide what do I pick for my next essay. And it, it's just a purely passion-based decision. Then she then asked uh, from your video, Anatomy of Happiness, when you talked about dispositionally sad or happy, don't you think we're emotionless by default? Or what if it's no question and we are by default sad because when a child is born, he cries, which is a sign of sadness. I mean, you have a good point, but just like people have temperaments and different types of personalities, I believe people are, for the most part, primarily predisposed to being happy or being sad and regardless of the situation they stick to their disposition i mean not by design or not by putting an effort into that it's just the way they are when a child is born he cries well like i said in the in, in a strictly poetic manner we find ourselves in the middle of this life that we did not ask for and there's so much suffering around us that inherently deep down as a species we are in fact more sad than happy from your video infinity and beyond if real numbers and even numbers are equally infinite then how can some infinities be bigger than others well to understand uh, some how some infinities are bigger than others you have to understand the concept of bijection as well as something called diagonalization i tried to explain it in one of my videos but there are plenty of other videos on youtube those people explain it a lot better than i did so in diagonalization when you're trying to establish a one-to-one -one mapping between two sets suppose sets of natural numbers and a sets of numbers between zero and one you would always be able to find a number which exists between the range of zero and one that does not exist in the natural numbers when we try to map one item to from one set to the other one there will always be a number a brand new original number in the second set that doesn't exist in the first set therefore only proving that the second set is bigger than the first one because if it wasn't then a clear bijection or one-on-one -on -one mapping would have been easily established but that's not the case therefore we can conclude that the second set since it has more numbers than the first one is bigger than the first one all right uh let me know in the comments how this session went i hope it went well if there's anything that you would like me to address please feel free to follow me on my instagram also send me your questions on youtube you can also suggest some topics for the upcoming essays uh, there's plenty more that i'm working on and hopefully you will see some newer stuff coming up so i hope you enjoyed this video i'll see you in the next one for the office